And welcome back to High School Physics Explained. And today I would like to talk about nuclear fission. What is fission and how does that energy come out of the atom? But before we do that, let's have a little bit of a history. So nuclear fission was first demonstrated, though unbeknownst to the scientist at the time, by Enrico Fermi. Now Enrico Fermi was an Italian scientist who later became really important in terms of our understanding of the nucleus and also the Manhattan Project. But in 1934, just soon after the discovery of the neutron, he began to fire neutrons into large nuclei with the hope of making even larger nuclei. So uranium-238 is the largest stable nucleus. And so Enrico Fermi and other scientists were interested to see if they were, could produce larger nuclei by firing slow-moving neutrons into the nucleus. And he got some interesting results. He noticed that there were some elements in his sample that were a little bit lighter and not heavier than uranium. He didn't understand at the time why that was the case. In 1938, however, we have a major breakthrough. Scientists, in this case, three German scientists, uh, Otto Hahn, Strassmann and Lisa Meitner, were working again on bombarding uranium with slow-moving neutrons. And they got some interesting results. They discovered that, again, that there, were, there was this lighter element existing in their sample. And they found that this unknown element, lighter element, had some similar properties to barium. So particularly Otto Hahn and Strassmann worked on some chemical means to try to isolate this unknown Ra element, which was similar to barium. By this stage, Lisa Meitner had moved to Sweden with her nephew, basically to escape German persecution of the Jews. But she kept in regular contact with both Hahn and Strassmann. And so here's my Ra substance being created. And so then they had to try to isolate it. So the first thing that they did was to basically soak it in acid to get this, whatever this Ra is, is in solution. Then they added a carrier solution, in this case was barium chloride. So now what they had was a solution of both this Ra and this barium. They subsequently precipitated it by adding uh, H2CO3 in solution, and so they got a precipitate of barium uh, carbonate and this Ra carbonate. Having done that, they now mixed it with hydrogen bromide, again to isolate now a solution of simply this Ra and barium. And finally, what they did was they did some fractional crystallization on it. I won't go into the details of how that happened, but in essence, they were unable to separate the Ra from the barium. The summation really is here is uranium, at a, which is a large atom, and they caused a reaction in some way that produced a much lighter element. In this case, we understand it now to be barium. So what's going on? So Otto Hahn and Strassmann wrote their results, these weird results, to Lisa Meitner. And Lisa Meitner, along with her nephew, came to the conclusion that what they had done was they had split the uranium atom. They had broken the uranium into two smaller fragments and thereby releasing a fair amount of energy. And borrowing from the biological term of cell division, as called binary fission, they coined the term nuclear fission. So now let's examine this from a physics perspective. So here I have my neutron being fired in my uranium. It becomes 236. That goes fissile. It splits into two smaller nuclei. But not only that, we then also may release another neutron. And we could have more than one. We could have two or even three neutrons. You may be familiar already with this particular graph. And if you haven't watched my video on binding energy per nucleon, now's the time to do so. But in essence, it tells you the amount of binding energy per nucleon for all the atoms in the periodic table. And if you've watched my video, you might remember that the binding energy per nucleon increases as we go from hydrogen right up to iron and then it the decreases again. And so in other words, if we were to start from uranium, it increases from that perspective, it increases from that perspective, 
leading to iron here. And what that is saying is that iron is the most stable atom. That is, the binding energy of nuclear is the strongest in iron. In other words, it's the holds the atom most tightly together. And that energy comes from the mass defect, which is the difference in the mass of the total mass of the element from the individual protons plus neutrons and combined. And that energy is coming from the missing mass. That's hence called the mass defect. But the critical thing for us is, is that why is that creating energy in terms of fission? So let's have a look here at uranium-235. It has a binding energy of roughly 7.7. .7. If we then look at barium, you can see that its binding energy is significantly larger. In this case, around 8.3. And so what significance is that in terms of fission? Let's summarize. First of all, fission ultimately is when we have a large nucleus, so a large mass number, is split into two smaller nuclei and large amounts of energy is released as a result. Now, why is that the case? I'm going to explore that now. Let's look at the nuclear reaction. So here we have uranium-235. Uranium-235 is an isotope of uranium. So 238 is, is radioactive, but generally reasonably stable. 235 is by far the more radioactive or unstable version of uranium. We fire a slow-moving neutron into that nucleus. It becomes an intermediary uranium-236. Now, that is extremely unstable. And so very shortly after the production of uranium-236, we get two what we call fissile fragments. In both these cases, both this one and this one, we have something that is of smaller atomic mass. Now, what also happens is a release of some neutrons, which we'll discuss in a moment. But of course, we also have energy being released. Now, where does that energy come from? Well, the first thing to note is that the binding energy for heavy nuclei, as I stated earlier, is around 7.2 mega electron volts per nucleon. The binding energy for the intermediate nuclei, that is the smaller fissile fragments, is about 8.2 mega electron volts per nucleon. That means we have one mega electron volt difference. That means that we have a decrease of mass in the process. In other words, the total mass of the uranium is a lot larger than the total mass of the fissile fragments. And that mass is converted to energy by way of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. And that energy, of course, is the result of the fission event. Now, that amount of energy, in this case, what we're dealing here is one mega electron volt per nucleon. You can multiply that by the number of nucleons. So if we end up getting, let's say, an atom of, let's say, atomic mass of 200, then the amount of energy released in this case is 200 multiplied by my difference of one mega electron volt. And so we get 200 mega electron volts. Now, converting that to joules, that is quite a small number. Remember here, we're dealing the amount of energy being released in one fissile event, one atom being split into two. And the reality is, is that when nuclear fission takes place, it's not just one atom that goes fissile, but many. So let's examine what we call a chain reaction. And a chain reaction is where the neutrons of any fissile event is subsequently being used for another fissile event in a nearby uranium-235 atom. Now, before I explain that, I want to highlight, though, that the X and Y, the fissile fragments, don't necessarily have to be barium. In the first example, you see barium is being produced and the other element that's produced as a result is krypton. In the case of the experiments by Otto Hahn, Strassmann and Meitner, the krypton wasn't necessarily detected because krypton is a gas. But it could also relate to cesium and rubidium. It could lead to strontium and xenon. It could even lead to yttrium 
and iodine. So in each of the cases, we have smaller atomic nuclei being as a result of the fissile event. But now let's take a step back. So here we have uranium-236 produced by the firing of a neutron into the 235 nucleus. That produces, of course, in this case, barium and krypton with a release of energy. So we have energy being released here. In this case, we also release three neutrons. Now, what we're doing here is following the path of two of those neutrons. And in this case, we're having energy be released over here. Again, due to the uranium being split up into cesium and rubidium. Similarly speaking, we have energy being released at this junction. And of course, that continues. We have energy being released at this junction, at this junction, at this junction, and of course, at this junction. So one event over here ultimately leads in this diagram to one, two, three, four, five, six other events that occur in rapid succession. What we have here is what we call a chain reaction. And of course, the number of neutrons that are released will determine how many we get. Now, here we, of course, have a neutron that is not going into uranium atom, but it could easily do so. It's just that in terms of this diagram, we've not highlighted it. Here we only have two. And then generally speaking, if there's that the, if the uranium is of high enough purity, that is, there is enough uranium-235 in a sample of uranium-238, then this chain reaction can occur quite quickly. And if it is uncontrolled, then we have basically the beginnings of an atomic bomb. We have an uncontrolled chain reaction. If, however, I were to have less purity of uranium-235, and I need to make the point, 238 will not go fissile. It needs to be uranium-235 to go fissile or break up into smaller nuclei to produce energy. But if I have a lower purity, or I am able to somehow remove neutrons so that only one neutron actually continues on to collide with another uranium-235 nucleus, then I slow the rate of this down. And that, in essence, is how nuclear reactors work. They are still uh, allowing a chain reaction to occur, but we slow its rate down. So if it's uncontrolled, that leads to atomic weapons. If it's controlled, that leads to nuclear reactors. Generally speaking, though, with atomic weapons, it's not just the absorption of neutrons that is missing. Generally, it's the purity that leads to the quick chain reaction. So nuclear reactors do not have the purity in their uranium samples to lead to a chain reaction that could lead to an atomic bomb top scenario. But in essence, the process is the same. It's simply the rate that is different. So that gives you a summary of fission, the breaking down of large atoms into smaller nuclei with the release of energy. That energy ultimately comes from the difference in the mass, which can be attributed to the binding energy per nucleon. And that mass, of course, is converted to energy via E equals mc squared. In future videos, I'm going to talk to you a bit more detail about how a reactor works and how a nuclear bomb works. But also I will discuss on the other side of the binding energy per nucleon graph, where we have fusion. By joining smaller atoms into larger atoms, we can also release energy. But that's another video. I hope that's helped you. I would encourage you, if you feel so inclined, to uh, make a small donation to my channel to help me produce more videos, and you can um, support me as little as a dollar. Thanks for watching. Till next time, bye for now.